Sorry about that. All right, so for today, this is what we're gonna to cover today. We're going to introduce you to a few apps or get you more familiar with apps you may already know. Um, we're gonna cover Merlin. We're gonna cover All About Birds. We're gonna talk about iNaturalist and we're gonna talk about eBird. And if time allows, we will briefly talk about Picture This and Skyview. So if you have your phones with you and you downloaded some of these apps ahead of time, you can follow along. Um, that'll give you the familiarity of using the phone while we um, guide you through some of the movements in the phone. Alternatively, some of these tools can be run off of your computer. So if you know how to have two windows open at the same time, you can watch the presentation in one and you can have the online version of the tool open as well and move through that. For anyone that couldn't attend tonight, you saw that uh, I've recorded this. So if you don't wanna furiously take notes, you can revisit the recording after, which will be posted to the WBFN website um, in a day or two after this presentation wraps up. So before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. So in order to make this a webinar run smoothly, please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. And it's up to you whether you leave your camera on or off. Feel free to turn it off. I'm the speakers, myself, Jerry, and Chris, will keep our cameras on when we're speaking, but I will turn mine off when I'm not speaking. Please hold your questions to the end of each section. So as you saw on the agenda, we have four uh, key apps that we want to show you. Um, after each section, we'll pause for questions. So if you can hold your questions till then, that would be great. And there's a couple ways that you can ask questions. You can unmute yourself to ask the question, or you can type your question into the chat, which we'll be monitoring, and we'll um, we'll pull those questions up at the uh, the pause, and we'll go over them and hopefully be able to respond to all of the questions that we have. Um, if you don't know how to use the chat function, you what you do is you go to your uh, Zoom menu bar, and you'll see that there is an option called chat, and when you click on that, it should open a window to the side. Of your on the right side of your screen, and you can type your question in there. If you don't know how to unmute yourself, there is in the uh, the little square where your face would appear if you were sharing your video. There is in the top right hand corner there is an unmute button. You can click on that, or similarly in the Zoom menu bar, bottom left hand corner, there's an an icon of a microphone, and when you're muted, there's a red line through it. And if you want to unmute yourself, you just click on it, and it turns green. And then we can hear you talk. Um, let's see. Are there any questions on the logistics before we really dive into everything? Okay, I don't hear any questions. I don't see any questions coming up. All right. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. If you don't want to have the pictures of everybody on the screen, if you uh, mouse over the display of the faces at the top of your at the top of that box, there's a single bar, a fatter bar, a a double bar, or a three by three grid of of, uh, of of boxes, and those are the different views you can have. So if you want to only have the speaker, click on the first one. If you want to have a couple of people, click on the one with two and so on, but you can play with your different views there. All right, moving on. So today, joining me are two WBFN members and volunteers who are knowledgeable users of these tools and who volunteered their time to put together this presentation. Chris Ito is the WBFN treasurer and is an excellent birder and wildflower aficionado. She will be showing you the basics of eBird. Jerry McKenna is a member of the WBFN board and is an important participant in the Wesleyville project and a very knowledgeable naturalist. He will be speaking to you about iNaturalist. And I'm Marina Scassa and I'm the WBFN club secretary and I love everything nature. I'll be walking you through Merlin and all about birds. So first up is Merlin. So, put that away. There is a question in the chat. Oh, let me just see. Yep. Okay. Um, so Merlin, some of you have probably heard of Merlin. It is a fairly well-known app. 
Uh, Merlin is a free app, and if you want to download it, you just need to go to the Play Store or the Apple Store to do so. Play Store is for Android phones, Apple Stores are for iPhones. Primarily, this app is used for bird identification and for keeping lists. We are featuring this particular app because it is a very popular app. Many people are familiar with it already or are curious about it. And it's also a very good app, so we thought we would, we would show this one. But there are other apps out there in case you're interested. Some are free, some have a cost associated. Oops, wrong way, there we go. All right, using Merlin, there's several ways to identify birds. The first one is by sound. So if you're out in the field and you have your phone with you and you and you hear a bird singing, and you but you don't know what it is, you would use the sound ID. So you click on the button for sound ID. And then you quietly hold your phone so that the microphone can pick up the bird song. The top of the image that would pop up on your phone shows a graph where different sounds are being identified. And when it recognizes the bird, the species will pop up below. When you're finished recording, when you wanna stop it, you just press the red button to stop it. Once you finish recording, all of the birds that were identified show up. In this case, the singers were American goldfinches and pine siskins. If you want to learn more about each bird species, then you just have to press on the green arrow and it'll drop down and give you more information about the bird. If you wanna to listen to their songs again, or the song that you recorded again, you press on the green play button to do that. And if you don't want to keep this recording, you press on the trash can to delete it. If there's more birds singing and you wanna continue recording or start a new recording, self-evident, start a new recording. If you don't delete your recordings and you wanna revisit them in the future, if you're from the main page, you go to Mind Sound Recordings and a list of all of the recordings, dates and locations that you took them will appear and you can find the one that you wanna to listen to. The second way you can use Merlin for bird identification is with visual details. So you'll be asked a series of questions. The first one is, where did you see the bird? If you are using, if you have data on your phone and you're using it in the field, it'll pop up your, your location based on GPS, or you can enter a location. Next, it'll ask you, when did you see the bird? it'll automatically pop up today's date, the date that you're using. But if you want to refer to a different date and time, so uh, let's say you uh, want to check back on something you, you saw a month ago, you just have to click on the calendar, the little green calendar there, and you can enter a different date. And then you click next to move on. The next thing they ask you is what size was the bird? And the, they provide you with this scale, with these familiar birds so that you can, you can grade the bird that you saw against these things. So the scale starts with a sparrow, has a robin, a crow, and a goose. So you plot the bird that you saw somewhere along this scale. And in my example, I chose robin size for the bird that I'm trying to identify. And then you click next. So the, last, uh, the second to last question they'll ask you is what were the main colors? You can choose from one to three colors. And in this case, this example, I'm choosing, I chose black and white. I picked two colors. Then you click next to move on to the last question, which is what about what, uh, what action the bird was taking? So was the bird, and pick one of these six choices, in trees or bushes is what I picked. And then you click next. So then Merlin takes all of the input that you gave it and we'll pull up the best matches for your description. There may be only one good match. It does happen where only one perfect match lines up, or there may be multiples. And if you look in this case, you see the hairy woodpecker is the first one listed, but further down, it's scrolling on to yellow-bellied sapsucker. So you can look at these matches in a detail format. In this format, you can see the first best match listed at the top, but if you scroll down, you'll see the other choices. You can click on the speaker icon to hear what it sounds like. 
or you can scroll on the images to the right and you can see other images of this same bird in case, you know, in case there's a difference between a male and a female or an adult or a juvenile or so on. And if you're confident that this is it, you can click on this and choose, this is my bird, and then it will be added to your bird list. Similarly, in the list format, you can scroll down to see a full list of the possible birds. And once you pull up your bird species, you will see the same info as detailed in the detail look. So if I clicked on Harry Woodpecker, that green arrow, everything you see on the previous screen would show up. And likewise, you can choose that bird if it is your bird. So I just wanna point out that what's important here is the hairy woodpecker came up first because of the size choice I made. A lot of people have difficulty distinguishing between a hairy woodpecker and a downy woodpecker because they're so similar. But the size is one of the distinguishing factors. And had I picked a smaller size, downy woodpecker might've been the one that came up. But because of the size I put in it, put hairy woodpecker as my, my first best choice. The last way to identify an unknown bird is through a photo ID. You can take a picture from, from your phone or with your phone of a bird, but I find that really challenging to do with a, with a cell phone. Or you can choose a picture from a library. So if you have some pic pictures of birds already taken, you can load it to do the ID. Also, if you have, if you use a different camera to take photos, like I use a, a DSLR, DSLR camera to take photos, and if you know how to load photos to your phone, you could load the photo to the phone and then upload it here to get the identification. Now, Merlin, it will do its best to identify your bird based on the photo you submit, but um, it can only do as good as the photo that's supplied. So if it's a if it's an out of focus photo, if it's a photo that's taken with a lot of leaves and blocking the, a good view of the bird, it might give you a bunch of suggestions that may, may not be able to pinpoint it at all. I'm just gonna mention a few other features with Merlin. So um, the other thing you can do with Merlin is search a species by name. So on the main screen, click on the explore icon and it'll bring up a searchable list of birds for your region. So in this case, my region is right here, Canada East. So this is the first class of birds, ducks and geese, and that's where it starts. You can scroll down to see all of the ducks and geese, or if you want to jump ahead to a different class of birds, you can pick one of these icons. So this is herons, these look like waders and so on, doves, raptors, so on down the list. So you can just jump ahead further down the list. You can also do this where you type in the name or even part of a name, and it'll pull up the birds that have those key letters or keywords in their, in their name. So once your bird pops up that you're interested in learning about, you can click on the bird and it'll drill down into details as you saw on the previous screens about the bird with additional images to look at. So you can also keep your life list on Merlin which is fun. And um, it can tell you when you saw your bird for the first time. And you can scroll down to see your entire bird list. So um, I only started using Merlin in 2020. So 2020 was not the first time I saw a Canada goose, but it is the first time that it was recorded on this list. The other thing that's really great about Merlin is languages and uh, other, um, other regions that you can explore. So first off, in settings, if you want to look at other languages, you uh, here you can change things. So you can change the common name language. You can change, uh, you can have the scientific name display if you want. You can change the language that you're actually using the app in. So if you would prefer to use it in French or some other language, you can change, look at what the options are there. I've got it set currently where uh, the scientific name doesn't show up. So if you wanted to have that show up, you would just click that button over. The other thing that is a great feature here is um, how international Merlin can be for you. So um, it's heavy to carry books in your luggage. It's heavy when you're traveling to lug field guides out for all the different places you might be visiting. So what you can do with Merlin is download a bird pack for a region that you're interested in visiting. 
So you can see here that I've downloaded a few bird packs, New Zealand, Mexico, and so on. There are some others. There's a dot, dot, dot. So there's a few others. So when I go on vacation and I go to a different region, I just switch out of my Canada East and into the different country that I'm in. And you will have the birds for that region available to, um, to be identified by sound or by photo or by search. So um, you can see by this next image that there are tons and tons of choices of regions. So if you were traveling to Antarctica, you could pull up the Antarctic one, or you could just continue scrolling down and see what all of the options are, or you could just do a search for a particular country and see what comes up for a bird pack for that region. So just a few caveats about Merlin. Um, Merlin is very, very good, but it's not always right. Most of the time it is, but not always. So Merlin can be occasionally fooled by mimics and mimics are birds that are good at copying the bird songs of other birds, such as mockingbirds or thrashers or whatnot. So um, occasionally when it is a mockingbird singing, it might tell you that it is the bird that the mockingbird is mimicking, but that may not be true in all cases. So you just have to make sure of that. Um, Sometimes when Merlin isn't quite right, it might identify a rare or unusual bird. I remember once it told me that there was a Chihuahuan raven calling somewhere and Chihuahuan raven would only be in Mexico and not here. And so I didn't believe it. But you, you can, sometimes it's true. And you wanna just make sure that if you're going to report seeing an unusual bird or hearing an unusual bird, that you need to be sure. So I basically use Merlin as a um, as a way to give me clues to what I might find. And then when it if it tells me it's hearing an unusual bird singing, then I take the time to actually try to look and find the bird so that my eyes can confirm that it is in fact the bird that Merlin says it is. Ambient noise can really make it hard for the sound identification feature to work. By ambient noise, I mean uh, wind blowing in the trees, planes flying over, traffic, um, talking, the sound of you walking, rustling clothes, anything like that can make it difficult for it to work well. So you need to try to be as quiet as possible. And it helps if you don't, when you're holding your phone to listen to a bird song, don't cover the microphone with your hand. Make sure the microphone is free and accessible. And there's other animals that can make bird sounds or sounds that might be birds, but Merlin won't identify them. So squirrels do a lot of clucking and chattering that sometimes make you think there's a bird there, or even frogs can make some sounds that you can spend, you know, 10 minutes standing there trying to ID it, but it is in fact a frog. Merlin will not identify those for you. So when you want to learn more about Merlin, the best place to go is merlin.allaboutbirds.org. Um, that has all kinds of helpful information on how to use Merlin, including videos on how to use Merlin. But you can also go to YouTube and find videos that uh, will um, show you to how to use particular features of Merlin as well. So if you learn better by watching a video, check out YouTube and see what they've got online. So at this point, I'll pause and I'll op I'm open to any questions. I know I just browsed through the basics of Merlin, but if there are any questions, I can take them now either through the chat or please unmute yourself and ask a question. So my my question in the chat is um is my phone is too old to download Merlin? Uh -huh. I mean, what, what can I can I get an earlier version? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that is a question that I think you would be best to ask Merlin itself. Um. If you go on the website, the merlin.allaboutbirds.org, there's um, there's FAQs and help help function there. And um, somebody may have already asked that question, in which case the answer may be there. Or if nobody's asked it, you could probably ask the question and get a response straight from the source. Okay. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Any other questions? There's another question on uh, the chat for you. Yeah. Okay. Once you download a bird pack, can you use Merlin offline? Yes, you can. Um, okay, so yeah, that's that's possible. That's one of the benefits of downloading bird packs is you don't always have to have um, have data at the time. So if you're somewhere remote and you don't have a signal, then yes, you can still use it. Um, what you wouldn't be able to do is, so Merlin can talk to eBird, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. Um, your GPS location obviously wouldn't be working if you weren't getting the signal, that sort of thing. So, so some functionality may not work as well if you're not online, but the, the basic functionality of looking at the birds and IDing them would still work. And there's another question. Sometimes a red or orange dots come up next to a bird sound ID. What do they mean? All right. So the dots are, um, dots can reflect whether a bird is uh, uh, common or, un or more likely uncommon. So that a dot will pop up if it's a bird that is not expected to be in that area or is perhaps rare in that area. Um, it's not always, it's not always true. And I'll give you an example. So when I started using um, eBird and Merlin, I think I must have been the only person birding in the area near my house here. And I would, I would um, see a bird and I would report it. And it was something as simple as a yellow-bellied sapsucker. And they were everywhere. And the first time I reported it, I had seen six. So I reported six birds and it told me, no, that's an unusual bird. That's too many birds for your area. What was happening was that there had not been data being submitted from the area. So it was telling me it was an unusual bird. So over time, as I submitted more and more reports, um, you the the data started to show that it was very common to hear to hear or see that many birds in the area. The other things the dots can can signify is the level of accuracy. So if it's not sure, you can get a dot that shows that it's not sure that that's the right match. Anybody, any other questions? I've answered the ones in the chat. Now, is there anybody that wants to unmute and ask a question? Hi, Marina. Um, I was traveling and I loaded the Caribbean pack. And yep. then I went to a botanical garden in Martinique, turned on my phone, and it told me that I had a raven a tufted titmouse and a goldfinch, that uh, those were not what I was seeing. Uh, any idea why it didn't work? So um, you can you download the pack, but you also then have to switch to being in that region. So did you switch to that region? I was just looking for that, and I don't think I did, but I don't know how to do that. Okay, so in the, um, let me just go back a couple screens. Uh, close the chat here for a second. Okay, so in, in this spot where you're choosing the packs, um, I believe it's there that you switch packs as well. I'm just opening my phone right now to verify, so it will be easy to do. Um, I'm in settings, I'm going in bird packs. <sighs> Let's see. Okay, so. Settings. You click on. Huh. I know I did this the other day because I was using it in Mexico. <laughs> um, Chris, I'm going to throw this to you while I fiddle with this um, off the top of your head. Can you remember where this functionality is? I am the wrong person to ask Marina. Um, uh, oh, I've got it. Sorry, got Brian. Um, okay. When you have, once you have downloaded it, mm -hmm. you, you open that particular pack. 
So you look at, um, if you go to the, if you click on this part, it'll show you installed, recommended, and all. So if you look at your installed, so I have, for example, right now I'm on Canada East, but if I want to pick my New Zealand birds, I click my New Zealand pack and it would pop open and then it says uninstall or update. So if I click the update, it should become the pack that I'm using. Hmm. You with me? I, I am. I mean, I, it, it said it was installed, and I did this just before the trip, so I didn't think I needed to reinstall it. To there was nothing that said I yeah. had to Yeah, installing it. Yeah, installing it doesn't make it your active bird pack. You have to make it your active bird pack. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Janet and Bert. I was just wondering. Yeah, we were in Mexico ourselves, and I loaded the Mexico pack, but doesn't your phone if you have location on it knows where you are yes but if you haven't loaded the pack it's not oh, no. going yeah no i but they were asking about i have the pack and i was able to do it but i when i was in mexico it knew i was in mexico so i i put in the mexico pack and was right. able to identify the birds okay sure yeah I, I guess if you're using the gps component or the the you have um data then yes yeah, maybe that would... that's how we did it yeah okay yeah. yep thank you Thank you. Yeah, because the guy in Cuba maybe didn't have data. Yeah, yeah, that's that is the the challenge when you're traveling. Like it's not, it's not as flawless if you don't have data, and that's happened to me too, where you want to use it, but it you can't you can't use all of the functionalities smoothly when you don't have data. Hmm. Any other questions? Hello. Whoops. Hello. Hello. Um, coming back to the dots, yep. are the dots all this, the indicator dots all the same color? You mentioned an orange. Um, off the top of my head, um, no, I don't believe they are the same dots. So there's a blue dot. Um, there is a orangey colored dot. There's a half dot. Um, so the blue dot, if I, yeah, so I'm just trying to pull up one of my, um, one of my old recordings to see what the dots, if I have any dots on mine, just to refresh my memory. Okay, so I'm looking at a recording of a red cross bill and uh, it has a blue dot with a little check mark in it. So that was a sound recording. So what the blue dot with a little check mark pretty much means is they're sure that it's a red cross bill that made that sound. The different color dots will tell you the level of certainty. So if you got the little check mark, you can be pretty certain that Merlin is convinced that it's a red cross bill. The other dots will tell you that it's not as certain. And that could be for a few reasons that um, some birds have many different call types. Um, and while it might sound like a certain bird, it might not be 100%, or there could be the ambient noise that I mentioned that could be distorting it slightly, so it's giving you its best guess. The other thing that I learned, actually, when I watched uh, one of the um, courses about Merlin a while ago, was that they also don't include chip calls from baby birds for any of the species because it's too difficult for Merlin. So. Uh, that's something that has nothing to do with the dots, but that's just something I'm going to throw out there that even if you hear chip calling of baby birds and you're waiting for Merlin to identify them, you're going to be waiting a long time because that stuff is not built in. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? One more quick one. Uh sure. I switched phones and I don't know how to get my old uh, sound recordings from my old phone onto my new phone. Did you? Oh, okay. So that's, um, did you, you just moved your SIM card over? No, I just, uh, yeah, actually I did. That's correct. So I'm not super techie on that aspect, but I would have thought that um, and you reloaded 
And um, Merlin was on your other phone, I assume, because you had recordings. Yeah, I would have thought that when you transferred your SIM card over, everything would be there. No, no, no. Just have the just have the from January on. Don't have anything from last year or before. Oh well, doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can I can look into that for you, Brian. But I would have thought that they should have come across with your SIM card. Okay, and there's you. another question in the chat about access to internet. So yes, the app, the app will work uh, in its basic form when you don't have internet in the field. So if you had downloaded a bird pack for Canada East and you go out to the forest here, you should still be able to move around and use information related to what you had downloaded. Um, but what you wouldn't be able to do necessarily is uh, interface with eBird or use the GPS location to help pinpoint the type of bird um, or um, anything that would have required data. But it, it is still a useful tool, even if you don't have data. Oh, a suggestion is to check for updates on your new phone, Brian. Um, and that might update your list from your old phone. Thanks, Amy. Already, I can uh, I can do that. I believe I have done that, but I will double check. Thank you. Okay. Maria, Other... what do the half dots mean? Less less confident. Okay. All right. So. Um... If there's no more questions, and if you think of other questions, you can always send them along, or we can we can pause again later. Um, but what I'm going to do is move on to the next thing that I was going to show you, and that is All About Birds. So All About Birds is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website, and this website and all the data within it is, the, in fact, the backbone of Merlin and eBird. So it's Cornell who has put together these two apps of Merlin and eBird and um, the data that that helps identify by sound or by photograph or uh, by description is all here. This is the source of the information. So um, it is it's not a it's not a an app. It is in fact a website. So I'm just going to click here. And I am going to just stop sharing for one second and then reshare this. Uh -huh. Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So this is a great website. So it's allaboutbirds.org. And I'm just going to give you a really brief tour of it. Uh, I would highly recommend that you go and play around with it and look at it yourself. Um, but this is a great source of information. So first off, from the main page, if you just even scroll down, you can see featured articles and browse more articles. You can look at all these uh, articles about identifying birds. You can look at articles about feeding birds, frequently asked questions, common problems, bird houses, and how to uh, attract birds to your yard, and how to garden for birds, and so on and so on. So there's endless amount of information there. Up at the top here, there's a get involved button. If you click on get involved, you will see, I just love these photographs. Um, there's information on citizen science projects, on the Bird Academy, on educating children, on the bird cams themselves, on eBird, and they have a course on eBird, on the Macaulay Library, which is the source of all of the uh, photographs, and so on other things within this site. So when it comes strictly to birds, these are all of the things that are available through this site, including information on binoculars and gear and photography. Oh, that's and, good. Yep, sounds and songs and feeding birds and these bird ID skills. And then over here, you have live cams. So they have a, a bunch of cameras in various places that are either pointed at feeders or pointed at nests. And you can watch as the eggs hatch or as the birds lay the eggs and so on. It's uh, There's a lot of really cool happenings here. 
on the courses side, they have courses in all kinds of things, including how to draw birds and how to paint birds and how to photograph birds, but also bird identification. And I'll just click on this one. And you can see tons of courses. Here's eBird Essentials, which is a free course. Ducks and waterfowl, uh, shorebirds, warblers, and so on and so on. Now, um, Cornell does charge for their courses and caution here, this is USD, but they do often have sales on courses. Um, so this is totally uh, personal choice, whether you take these courses or not, but I, I actually have taken some of them. I find them very good quality courses, um, but I do try to buy them when they're on sale. And then over here is the info about Merlin. So if you want to learn more about Merlin, you can go in here as they develop the app, they know everything about it and they can explain how to use it and saving birds to your list and everything that I tried to explain to you, they can probably do it way better and in so many different ways. So if you had more questions uh, that I have been unable to answer or you wanna dig deeper into a particular aspect, you can visit this page and you can drill down and learn more. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I wanted to show you about this website, if I could just get back to the main page. All right, this is probably the thing that I use most here is uh, information about birds themselves. So I'm going to use a sharpshin hawk as, hawk as an example because it is a bird that I often uh, have difficulty identifying differently from a Cooper's hawk, hawk. So if you click here and you type in the name of the bird you're interested in, it'll pop, populate as you type. And I'm going to pick sharpshin hawk. So here's where you can get detailed information about a particular bird. So in the overview, you have lovely pictures to look at, but you have this kind of information here. You have range maps, you have basic descriptions, information about what they're doing in your backyard, how to, where to look for this bird and so on and so on, lots of info. If you click here on listen, you'll hear the bird calls. Now I'm not gonna click it because it'll wake up my cats and drive them crazy, but um, this is where you can hear the different calls that the bird would make. If you drill down on the ID info, you have a whole series of photos of the bird in different plumages at different ages. So here's here's an immature, here's one in flight. Um, and you can read the information down here that tells you what makes them, um, what's key to their identification at this stage. But what is really useful at times is when you have two species that are very similar. So here you can look at them side by side, a sharp shinned hawk versus a Cooper's hawk. Now it's still difficult to tell the difference, but here you're looking at them together and you have information about the sharp shin, and then you have what's different about a Cooper's here. And even within this, I could look at different kinds of sharp shin pictures. Let me look at the one in flight and click over here and look at a Cooper's in flight and you can see the differences. Now, sometimes there's more than one species that might be considered similar. So if you keep clicking, you can see now the next species that comes up is a Merlin. So some people might think these two could be confusing, but if you look at the photos, you can see, oh yeah, this is the difference between the two and so on. So this is one mm -hmm. thing that, that uh, one of the functions in here that I use uh, quite a bit is sometimes I come home from a hike and I've seen a bird and I'm not sure, I might go in here and look up what I think it is and then figure it out. Um, so I think I'm going to stop at this point and switch back to the presentation. So let me just stop the share and then reshare my slides. And we're back and say, Thanks. are there any questions about all about birds? It's a great tool. I would just highly encourage anybody who's interested to just go and click around in it. There's lots of good stuff there. A lot of it's free. Some of the courses are free. Some of them are not. But 
lots of good information there. All right, well, if there are no questions, I am going to hand over now to Jerry. Thanks, Marina. So the first challenge of the tech savvy is how I actually get my presentation and everything to show up. So here we go. Um, okay, I got a little bit of coaching earlier today from Marina. So let's so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And I got to go here and my, oh, I got to find a little, there we go. Okay. And you see that, Marina? Is it all up? It's good. Okay. Thanks for that. That was really interesting. No, no, no. And, I've got uh, just it. It's like oh. it's still here. Okay. Where's the wine? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to ask everybody to make sure you're muted. Um, David, I don't think you're muted right now. If you could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So, I thought it was really interesting. And and, um, and uh, Merlin is like a um, fascinating program. It's actually, I, I find it an excellent program to... Um, to get non-birders interested just for the fun of it. I've got several birders who kind of, people who are non-birders and they get hooked on it and next thing you know, they're, they become birders. So it's a, it should be, you always feel encouraged to share it with uh, other people and family that you might be interested. But uh, one thing I did find is that there is one animal that can mimic a bird and uh, and that's my border terrier, Angus. He keys out as a great blue heron apparently. So all these years I thought I had a dog and. I've been keeping a great blue heron um, in in my house, so his bark <laughs> keys out as a great blue heron. But uh, and the other thing is, I I think I'll, that a great point about the immature birds and their calls not Merlin not identifying them. I had a it took me a while trying to it was driving me crazy to um, trying to using Merlin to figure out something was calling out in the field. It turned out it was a great horned owl begging call, which uh, thanks to Elizabeth Kellogg. Help me out with that one and solve that mystery. But uh, anyways, it's a great program. Um, kind of a natural flow into iNaturalist um, because they share a lot of the same type of attributes. And um, so iNaturalist um, is, a, is, is a very powerful and, and, and uh, useful tool. And um, it's also available as a free app downloading from the Play Store or the Apple Store, it's just like Merlin is. The um, it, it provides a place that you can record and organize all your nature findings. You, know, you can meet other nature enthusiasts and learn about the natural world because when you, when you get to really start to use it and actually start to use the website, you start to interact with um, uh, other, other experts in their various fields. And the one thing an iNaturalist has is a uh, the very uh, strength of it is it's not just birds. It's it's useful for the idea of of um, plants, animals, fungi. Um, you know, it, it's very uh, it's very wide ranging. So it's not just limited to to identification uh, and observation of birds. Um, and the observations uh, that are you that you load put through the app um, are reviewed and verified by experts. So it, it's a way of helping you to uh, identify species that you're not sure of, or to, it, it actually um, allows um, your observations that you submit to be reviewed and and, and sometimes even um, suggested corrections to, to what you saw. So we'll see a little bit of that in the, in the coming slides. And it, like, uh, like Merlin, it's global in scope. And, uh, and it, it, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a kind of a way to travel the world without leaving home if you, you know, want to do birding. So with that, um, the iNaturalist keeps the records of your observations. So, um, and then there's, you can see there it that when you first open up the app, um, you're it'll open up and it'll show you your observations that you have so far. So in mine opened up, said 863 observations that I've made covering 249 species. And you can see some of the examples that are there. And um, and when you um, click on the 
green uh, button at the bottom, it takes you to your various options that you have to either take a photo of what you're seeing in the field um, or choosing an image that's already on your phone to submit um, for identification. You can record a sound that, of something that you're listening to or hearing in, in, out, in, out uh, in nature. And it also choose a sound. If you happen to, to, to have a sound recorded on your phone, you can actually bring up the app and, and, and choose that sound and it'll help you to identify it. I'm not gonna talk too much about the no media one, just in the interest of time. And it's not one that I've really used much. So I'm just gonna focus on those four. So the photo um, function um, through iNaturalist. So if you select the take photo app, and so you're out, you're out in the ravines or, or wherever you might be, and you see a, you see a mushroom uh, uh, growing in, in, the, uh, in the bottom of the ravines, uh, you're not sure what it is. So you, you can take, a, you hit the take photo function and it, and it engages your camera. Um, and you can, you can focus to a certain um, uh, boundary. And once you, you're happy with the photo that you have, you can hit the, the yellow check mark. If you're not happy with it, just hit that uh, return arrow button to the left of it and do it again, take it when you like. But once you've loaded it up, the next screen, the panel three comes up and you can see there's a picture of your mushroom and you have a bunch of information. It, it may populate your location and it'll also ask you, what did you see? Use suggestions. Now, if you, if you um, click on that um, on the green button, what happens was it'll bring up a, a list and it'll say, we're pretty sure it's in this genus. It's an Amanita mushroom of some kind. And then it'll give you the top suggestions based on the, on your photo. And with those, uh, you can you can decide, well, yes, I, I'm not really sure I've looked at those, but I think I'm just gonna stay with the level of genus and I'm gonna let iNaturalist identify it uh, to a species level. And so if you click on the button, it'll it'll show you a little more information about Amanita mushrooms. Um, I'm going to talk about the compare button in the next example, but you could do a comparison uh, of your photo to um, to establish photos similar to what Merlin did, uh, sort of the, um, the uh, Cornell site does with the birds. And uh, But I'm going to show that in the next example, just in the interest of a uh, uh, of time. But it, when I hit select, and you can see now it's changed my observation. It says an Amanita mushroom. I put some notes in there. I typed some notes under, uh, said it's where it was found. So that might kind of sometimes helps in the identification. Where was it found? And then I click the green check mark. And then you can see my screen returns. It's got my previous observations, but now it shows that it's it's uploading my latest observation. And, um, and once it's uploaded, um, then it'll um, at some point someone will someone will look at it. It may be take a, it may take it's not often immediate. It may take um, a few days. Before some, I've had some observations that have actually been months before someone got back to me. But often they're, they're usually pretty quick. And uh, someone whose specialty is in the area of, of fungi would uh, would would respond um, and with an update uh, either on a species level identification of what you have. But uh, if you look at your observation um, in, in the last frame, you can see where it shows you what you've pictured you've taken, and it shows the geographic location in the uh, window below. The next option in iNaturalist is to choose an image. So this could be something that's already on your phone. You're not necessarily using the uh, AI the iNaturalist uh, take photo option, you've taken a picture of something and it's on your phone. And so now you want to see if you can identify it. So you select the choose image. So it brings up a number of your photos. Um, here I could pick that um, uh, picture of Angus, but all I would get would be a goofy border terrier in response. And I, I already know he's a goofy border terrier, so I'm not gonna pick him. But there was uh, uh, this is an example of an insect that we're, that we're gonna uh, process through iNaturalist app. So I select that photo and then I come to the, what did you see? So I press on that and you notice that it's already populated the, um, the rest of it as the time it was, it was observed in Prince Edward County. That was actually in Sandbanks Provincial Park. And then the next frame, 
after I've said, what did you see? I'm looking for suggestions. It brings up a picture, uh, the same picture, but it gives us the genus, uh, Lithoceros. And it, the top suggestion is American giant water bug. It looks pretty close. And I mean, I'm, I'm almost sure I could just sort of select it there and, and, and be done with it. But if I want to go a little bit more information, I can go to the next one. I can hit the compare button. And this is the compare button that was on the previous uh, um, example as well. So I want to see the compare button. I want to compare my picture to the, the picture that uh, iNaturalist has provided. And it'll give you a number of, of examples. You can scroll through them. You can see at the bottom here, these arrows left and right, you can scroll through more pictures of American giant water bug. But here's the picture I took. And this is a picture, and I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the back arrow. Brings me back to here again. Now it's populated with American giant water bug. And I'm happy I can put notes in here if I want to. Um, I can add it to a project, which I'll, I'll talk about project at the very end of the uh, of my uh, presentation and talk a little bit about that. But it's a pretty it's a pretty cool feature. Now down here also there's a delete button. If you want to just say forget the whole thing, you can hit delete and and the, and you're back to the beginning of your of your app. But if I hit the check button, now I have as you see it's loaded up into my observations. Now this will go loaded up into the AI Naturalist website and um, where, where somebody will review it. And if they confirm and verify that that's what you have, it'll be verified and given a grading, um, any from research grade, which means it can be used for, uh, with great certainty, it can be used in, in any type of research project. project. Um, and, uh, and so it gives you a little bit of a, uh, uh, you're contributing to a citizen science um, effort as well. I look at the sound. So the iNaturalist does have a sound fa uh, feature. It's not quite as uh, intuitive and as and as, as easy to use as a Merlin, but it it is um, it is a way that you can record a sound and upload it to get it uh, evaluated. If you're not, especially if you're not sure what you're hearing. Um, uh, Maria talked about some things that you know sound like birds, but they're not birds. So this is kind of a good feature for iNaturalist. So if you pick the record sound button and you come to this audio window here and you hit the play button here it's on pause that's when i stopped it but you hit the play button and you can see the the sonic uh, um, uh, illustration here and hit save so now that this is saved as a wave file and when i hit the save third window comes up and, and now you see rather than a picture as was in the last example I gave, it's got a play button that indicates it's a recording. Now, if you, it, it gives you, it does populate some of the information of location, um, but if I want to say, okay, what did you see? Well, I think it was a frog. I'm not sure. So I'm going to go to the next, I press that and I go to the next window and I start typing frog and it brings up some suggestions, frogs and toads, frog hoppers. And that. Well, I know it's none of these. I know it's a frog, but I think it's a frog and a toad or a toad. So I'm going to select this option and then I'm going to let iNaturalist help me out with um, identifying it maybe down to verifying it's a frog and maybe even giving me the species. So that's how the record sound works. So if you press that, it'll also, also give you information generally about frogs and toads. I'm pretty sure it's a frog and a toad. I'm going to hit select. And it goes up rather than as a species level, like you notice the water bug we had down to species. Here it's just down to a genus level. And um, and then I'll I'll select the green check mark. It'll upload it. And now in the third window, you can see it's gone up to iNaturalist as a frog. As I'm saying the frog and a toad. I'm looking for someone who who can identify it for me. And and they will make a suggestion, and I accept that suggestion this will next time show up as say a spring peeper or you know um or uh, or american toad or whatever it might be and if you if you're curious to see how your observation is 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 appears you can see there's the uh information on the play and there's the location here in the again gps window below now this is um another way of using Merlin for uh, for sorry for iNaturalist for sound. 
you can choose a sound, something you may have recorded either using a different app or just using the, your um, your uh, recording ability on your on your on your camera, on your iPhone, on your on your phone. And uh, I discovered that actually a lot of the Merlin calls that I have get stored in the audio. I have a I have a uh, Android phone. Get stored in, in, into an audio file in the auto section under settings, and there's actually a Merlin folder. I've actually found a bunch of Merlin recordings in here. So if you're not aware, then you might actually have Merlin calls in here. And there's ones that we didn't weren't able to identify the species. You could pick one of these, and you could select one of those, and you could load that into iNaturalist. And again, you go through the same speed uh, process that we did with the frogs and toads, the green check mark, and then it comes up as unknown species. But that's fine because it'll go up to iNaturalist. Uh, someone will give it a listen to it and make a suggestion on what it is. Yeah, and this is where you know this this app will uh, you'll get the information through the app. But it, it's even um, more gratifying if you go on the website and you can see uh, a little more information about your observation that you uploaded. Now, this is um, kind of a, a link about Merlin and iNaturalist can work together. And the first screen here, you can see I, uh, I've used a, a Merlin and I got no, I didn't get any matches on a recording. But there's a little share button here. And, and if you hit that share button, it brings up this screen and it'll show a number of your current most recent apps that you've used. So I wouldn't recommend choosing mom for text because she just probably doesn't want to hear what kind of recording you're sending her. She'll think, what the heck is that? So don't choose mom or anybody else who's not involved. But you could choose, you know, if you've been using iNaturalist or you could choose iNaturalist, which I have here, I can click on iNaturalist and then the iNaturalist window pops up and automatically populates everything that was from that Merlin recording. And then you can see there's the same process then follows afterwards as we've seen in the previous examples. You know, it could be an unknown species you, you, and it comes up as an unknown species. And you can just upload that to, that gets uploaded to iNaturalist. And again, um, it's a good way of, uh, if Merlin can't solve it for you, perhaps it, it, it loads up to iNaturalist where some expert can listen to it and give you um, an example. I'm just gonna move this window out here. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the website, which is a lot of fun, and I encourage you to explore it. I'm again, I'm just hitting this high level, but I got a couple of things here that you know um, that are, are I found kind of kind of cool. Uh, so iNaturalist website it's free and easy to set up an account. So you, you just go up and, and set up your own account. And iNaturalist started out as a as a master's final project by three students, grad students at UC Berkeley in California, and it's now global in scale. It's just it's been around for a few years now. And it uses a, um, a whole uh, bunch of experts who help in identification. They validate the observation and they grade them. I mentioned the research grade um, or versus maybe a casual observation. So if it's a research grade, it can be used in citizen science and actually regular scientific uh, investigations. Um, the photos that you submit not, don't actually have to be of the animal that you're you're, you're looking for, but it can be tracks, it can be nests, it can be scat, it can be other types of evidence that can be that can be uploaded as well. Um, you know, and uh, you look at like in, you know, if you look at the, the tracks, uh, one of the one of the experts in the ID there is is Don McLeod. He's actually somebody who does evaluations on on um, on people who upload things to iNaturalist. Um, it provides plenty of resources. Um, manuals and guides and it has uh, a bunch of filters that show that you can show you specific data um, now I want to show this on the second panel here if this is an example where the the expert ID can come in so I had submitted something uh, 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 Merlin had identified something as uh, that recording I had as a Carolina wren um, uh, so I uploaded it and I, I I said I suggested it my suggestion was this recording was a Carolina wren um, a week later, or sort of a little bit later, um, I got a review from one of the, uh, the people from my naturalist who said that they they disagreed with with this um, uh, observation. They said 
states suggested it was a ruby crown kinglet, and they went into the details. The high part and bounce at the beginning can be heard in the second and fourth song. So I went back and listened to it. Sure enough, I could hear it. I didn't hear it when I was listening to it until it was pointed out. And you know, so at this point, you can either agree with the evaluation um, or you or you can disagree with it. And in this case, I agreed with it. And that enabled that to be verified as a ruby crown kinglet. And it was assigned a research grade, which meant that it had enough evaluation to be considered uh, valid as a ruby crown kinglet. So it, it's kind of uh, useful in that way. Um, and then on the left here, I show a project. So iNaturalist is a... Um, it can can is a global in scale. So whenever you upload an example, um, it'll go in and upload um, uh, it, that information to that G, that location where you saw the observation. But you can also have specific projects, and projects are special special um, um, uses of iNaturalist. And I'm going to click on this one. It's called the Westfield Biological Inventory. So this uses the geographical parameters that we have set up for Wesleyville. So I hope, bear with me, here we go. I'm gonna leave this the safety of this slide deck and go into the website, maybe never to return. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so this is the Wesleyville Biological Inventory. So this is a, a project that's been set up. And what happens is if you're within the defined boundaries of this, of this uh, project, Anything you upload will populate this project. With it. It's GPS based. So it's a very useful way of taking a specific area that you want to get a biological inventory um, for long term studies. Um, and you can see here where, um, you know, so far we've had 1400 observations or, or we've identified 442 species. 384 people have, then, have submitted observations and we've had, uh, identifiers, sorry, 384 identifiers have been. Um, identifying and validating some of the observations from 45 observers. And uh, you can see here at RG on this where it says wood frog. I uploaded an audio of a wood frog and it was validated and assigned a research grade. Um, so it, it has a lot of uh, really cool functions that way. Um, you can do statistical work. So I go on stats. And you get these cool wheels that come up. And you can see here, of all the observations, the 1,400, we, all these ones here, 1,105 are considered research grade. There's a number that are just still pen, need more information to make a make a, a research grade observation. So they're they're assigned as a needs ID. And then you have a cat in between casual. We don't have that in here, but a casual is even less information that that is submitted. Um, so you're really kind of trying to hit the green area here, the dark green area here to get lots of research grade observations. But you can also see the breakdown of the observations. You've got 442 species and they're amongst these various categories. So you say we have 139 species of birds so far have been, have been uh, uh, identified, uh, 169 species of plants and so on. And if you click on any part of this wheel, you can, you can see some, you can kind of scroll through a number of these I just uploaded a whole batch load of audio observations, but these could just as easily be photographs. So um, that's uh, to keep in mind. Now, to look at, I'm just going to quickly look at some of the drop down um, areas that you have here. You have all your your observations. So anything you've submitted, you can bring up and look. This is only ones that you've submitted and you can see your particular stats. So it's, it's not anybody else. These are the ones that you yourself have identified. Um, and if you uh, look up in the right here, right where the little red, uh, at the top right corner, there's a little red, like a question mark and has a red one. That means that somebody has done an evaluation. So so this guy, Paul Dennehy, identified, added an identification to an observation that I made. And, and he said that, my thrush, um, I updated some that sounded like a thrush. I wasn't sure what it was a wood thrush or a hermit thrush or whatever it might have been. He said it needed more ID. Um, and it was always, he was looking for more information. But sometimes when you when you get when you click on this, it'll give you information on, um, like I showed earlier. Uh, and I have a really good example I want to share with you. Those who were at the, the uh, 
saw the meeting the other night with um, with Jen uh, Doubt. Um, and I just happened to notice that I had submitted quite a while ago this this what I thought was a fungi in in the Wesleyville ravines or moss. And I took took a, a flyer. I thought it looked to me everything looked like a common apple moss. Jen waded in. She said she disagrees that it's common apple moss. She said it's a member of the joint tooth moss family. I looked at what she had submitted. I did the, hit the compare button, and I agreed. And I and once I agreed, it was you know, at the family level. It was identified as an NHA and member of the joint tooth mosses. So maybe not down to species level, but pretty pretty close. So it's very um, uh, useful in in that regard to uh, to to um, identifying that type of thing. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about uh, mention is that you can see there's other projects. You can, there's all kinds of projects around the globe. Uh, Herbs of Ontario, Moths of Ontario, Butterfly Atlas. So wherever you are, if you upload uh, Monarch Butterfly up to iNaturalist, the Ontario Butterfly Atlas probably is going to pick it up. They have this automatic way of picking up uh, people's observations depending on their area of interest. So you're contributing to uh, to a you know a regional or or even a, a national type of uh, database whenever you load up your observations to iNaturalist. So I guess I encourage whenever you're out using e, uh, uh, Merlin or whatever, consider uh, loading up your observation or sharing it to iNaturalist. Um, and there's uh, resources here. There's all kinds of help, tutorials, uh, teaching guides, um, and all kinds of uh, tax information. So it's, it's a wealth of information in here. And even the, uh, the the scale of the area, if you if you go down here, the scale of observations is global. I mean, it's you can you can go all over the globe and look at what people have seen up in the north or down or in the rainforest or wherever you want to go. It's it's got a lot of fun just to kind of muck around and do that. Um, so with that, and I'll see if I can get back to my presentation. I think I'm back. Um, so yeah, so I encourage you just, just to go have fun with it, um, play with the app, and um, and uh, explore, and uh, and then it, it like I say it it helps uh, not only for birds you can identify, but anything else that you might see that you're not quite sure what it is. And then with that, I'll take questions. I'm going to stop share. And see if I have any questions here. So again, you can unmute yourself to ask a question, or you can type a question in the chat, and uh, we'll look at that question. I've got a question about uh, locating projects. I, I'm looking at my uh, Android, and I, I said I'm in Port Hope, and I said projects nearby, but I don't see Wesleyville as one of them. Um, you, is this because do... it's defined by a geographic fence, but not uh, an area of interest or? Um, gosh, but I, I think, I think did you try typing in the word Wesleyville. No, or... I just said, give me nearby ones. I'm just trying to use a oh. um, geographic uh, yeah. basis for it's telling me about yeah, it's not it's not bringing that one up. It could be. I'm not sure what the range is on mm -hmm. your on what's considered to be nearby. That's um, going taking me into Toronto. That's oh, is it? Okay, that that's interesting. I don't know why it would because it is it is public. I mean, if I shared the the uh, website link to anyone, anybody can go in and, and find it. In fact, you know, some of the other um, projects have found the Wesleyville one just by by doing a general search. So I'm not sure why it's not picking up from your, um, no, nah. let, let me, let me muck around with that. Uh, I've actually, uh, truthfully, I've never played with that. Um, let me, let me, let me explore that for you and see if I can figure out why it's not calling it up. Thanks. I typed in Wesleyville in this location and it came up right away for me. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, and, okay. and, and just actually, I saw your recordings, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And to see the species, I just from there I just clicked on the species, and I see four hundred and thirty-five species is what I can see, and there's right. three hundred eighty-four identifiers. So 
it wasn't hard to get to. I just had oh, to good. type in Wesleyville in the location. Okay. And it came up right away. Okay, try that, Brian, if you if you're if you're yeah, it's the Wesleyville you're... Natural Heritage Area. That's right. Well, there, yeah, there's, so it's called the the title of the um of the uh, project is the Westville Biological Inventory. So it should come up with the, you know the picture of the green heron on it and and all that. That's the one well, you should I, be seeing. I should just yeah. There we are. Yeah. Wow. You'll see a map on the page where it shows the boundaries and all the little colorful balloons mm -hmm. that. That have all the different uh, colored for each different type of species. Little blue balloons would be like the bird ones. Green balloons would be plants, and so on. So you can, if you drag your mouse over that window that shows all the balloons over the Westerville area, it'll it'll and it hover over it. It'll actually tell you what that balloon is representing. Oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll mute now. Okay, so let me. Uh, so Jerry, I don't uh, have any questions for you in the chat. I think okay. you must have you've you did such a thorough presentation. You answered everybody's questions. Yeah, they're totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry. Last call for questions before we move on to eBird. All right, well, let's turn it over to Chris then. Okay, um, thanks, Marina. I'm gonna try to share my screen, hang on. All right. Okay, I hope everybody can see uh, the first eBird slide. Marina, are we good? You're good. We're good, okay. All right, um, so welcome to eBird. Uh, eBird is both a website, and a free mobile app. These two versions are designed to work in harmony. Each complements the other. And tonight I'm gonna to flip back and forth uh, between both. Okay, so what can you do with eBird? Well, you can keep track of your bird lists, your bird photos and your bird sounds. You can find more birds and you can contribute to science and conservation. All right, let's begin with uh, the website. So to create a new account using the eBird website, um, it uses a fairly simplified account setup uh, with minimal personal information required. So um, I've shown you the, the sign up screen. It just asks for your name, a username, password, and email address, pretty standard stuff. Um, real names are strongly recommended, but you can opt for a pseudonym um, if that makes you more comfortable. And the username um, is not gonna appear on sightings or reports, uh, but it can be used to share lists with friends. Um, and some people wonder why, um, why do we recommend using your real name? Well, with the exception of young children, most eBirders do use their real names. Um, it's recommended because although eBird is a global database, on a regional level, it has real people volunteering as reviewers. And as birders, we're part of a community that can learn and grow together. And it's much nicer to know who we all are. But again, totally uh, up to you, what, whatever you're most comfortable with. All right, um, so we're gonna flip over to the mobile app for a second. Um, so to get started with the mobile app, uh, you can sign in using an existing eBird account, or you can create one right here. So if you look at this uh, first panel um, screenshot of the app, uh, there's a nice big button at the bottom that will let you create a new account. So um, after you've done that, it is going to ask you to select bird packs, um, as in this second panel. Uh, you've already heard Marina talk about uh, bird packs for Merlin. Um, it's very similar. Uh, it just needs to know um, where you are or where you hope to be traveling. And um, you can either uh, look at the packs they suggest or you can browse all the packs. So if you're planning a 
trip somewhere exotic, you can be sure you have the right birds loaded. And um, by using the bird packs, um, it enables uh, you to to uh, do your birding offline. You don't have to rely on data. Um, and lastly, it's a good idea to allow location services on your phone um, again, so that e so that uh, eBird knows where you are and can offer you um, a list of birds that you're more likely to to find as opposed to giving you a giant list of all the birds in the world. All right, um, a quick note about privacy. I think eBird's pretty good with this. Uh, you can choose an anonymous, uh, to be anonymous um, instead of showing your, dis your display name. Uh, you can hide your checklist, you can hide your comments, um, you can hide all those things from public output. Uh, unfortunately, the mobile version does not uh, provide direct access to these settings. You need to go to the website. Okay, um, you can also have a public profile, um, but this is completely optional. Not all eBirders bother to do this. Uh, you can provide as much or as little uh, personal information as you want. Um, again, uh, eBird Mobile does not currently provide uh, direct access to this feature. So um, uh, this is my own little profile. Um, it just has some basic information, my latest activity and photos. Uh, at any time, if I wanted, I could go in here um, to edit my profile and, and I could shut it down so that uh, it becomes private um, and no one else would be able to see it. Okay. Um, all right, back to the mobile app. So um, if you're birding with the app, um, the first thing that you're gonna see is this first panel. Uh, the date and time will autofill to the current time, or you can manually override that um, and adjust it if you're if you're posting your list after the fact. If if you finished birding a while ago and you're in the comfort of home, you can you can still use the app to post your list. Um, all right, so then you're going to uh, toggle the record track button down near the bottom here. You can um, toggle this on or off. Um, if you put it on, uh, the track will create a map of your route and calculate the distance traveled. This map will not appear on public reports. You're the only one who's gonna be able to see it. Um, but it is kind of handy to, to let the app do that work for you, especially um, especially nice that you don't have to try to calculate the distance that you've you've walked, that the, the app is doing it. Um, but again, if, uh, if you don't want to use that feature, you can just turn this off um, and then later you'll, you'll just have to figure out um, the distance you traveled yourself. Okay, so um, uh, we've turned on the track. And we're gonna hit the big green button um, to start your checklist. And that will take you to this next panel, showing you a list of possible birds um, in the location that you are. And you have a couple of ways to manage this uh, screen. You can simply scroll through the list of birds and click on the little plus sign and it will add birds one at a time. So if I saw one Canada goose, I can click on the plus sign. Um, but if I'm standing in a field and there are 2000 Canada geese, I really don't wanna hit that plus sign 2000 times. So just click on the, the species name. And once you click on that name, it will open up um, a window where you can type the number in directly. Um, it will also uh, has a little space where you can add comments or if you want uh, to include um, uh, breeding codes, you, there's a space for that as well. Um, and also if you wanted to um, add or subtract or just revise the total number of um, birds, again, just click on the species name and, and correct the number that way. Okay, so, um, all right, so you've um, added your birds and we're gonna go to the next slide. And you're done birding and you're getting ready to submit. 
Um, okay, so if you look down at the bottom of this first panel, there's a little green check mark and a number. So um, if you click on the check mark, it brings you to a list of just the birds um, that you've seen on your outing. And um, you can uh, do a quick review. Um, and I'll point out that uh, Ebert has the, a similar system of dots um, that Marina was talking about with Merlin. Um, they're a little simpler to understand, I think, here, though. Um, uh, there are orange dots and red dots. So in this case, um, it's just telling me that uh, ravens are somewhat uncommon for this um, time and place. But down here, there's a red dot beside uh, the crossbill. And there's also a big letter R. So this is telling me it's a rare bird. Okay, so um, I've got my list. I'm finished birding. So I'm gonna click that stop button. And when you do, um, the app is going to ask you if you want to stop the track or do you want to keep birding? So um, you're done. So you're going to click stop the track and it will take you to this next panel where we have to fill in um, some extra information. So uh, starting at the top there, um, the time and date, um, you've already entered it in or it's done uh, generated it automatically. Um, but you do need to choose a location. So if you click on the location box, a map is going to pop up. It's going to make some suggestions. If there's any nearby hotspots, you might want to choose those. Um, or you can create a new location. Um, it, it's fairly self-explanatory once you click on this. Uh, then it's going to ask you for the, uh, the protocol. Um, were you stationary? Were you traveling um, or is it an incidental report? Um, uh, the number of uh, people you were birding with, um, the duration and uh, the distance, those would be automatically filled if you were using uh, the tracking feature. Otherwise you'll have to fill those in yourself. Okay, uh, and that's gonna ask you, um, is this a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? So the answer is always yes, unless your protocol was incidental. And by incidental, it means that birding was not your primary purpose. So for example, you were driving down the 401 and you saw a red-tailed hawk in a tree. So you can report that bird, um, but use the incidental protocol because you were, not, you were not birding as you're driving your car, you just happen to see one bird. So, um, in that case, the answer to the question, is this a complete list, is, is definitely no. Okay, um, and then there's a space you can um, add uh, checklist comments. And, and this is really um, up to you. This does not affect the data. This can be personal. Um, I like to just put the weather in there. Um, you might wanna make um, some extra observations if, um, you know, if you saw a coyote or there was, you know, something, some really interesting behavior, um, whatever you want, it's, that's kind of up to you. All right, so this is our last chance to review our list before we actually submit it. Um, you can only see the first couple of species here, but um, uh, you would be able to scroll down and see your full list. So this is my last chance to deal with that <clears throat> red dot and the red cross bill. And before I can submit it, um, I would actually have to provide a written uh, description of my observation, uh, just to um, reassure the um, the eBird reviewers that I'm I'm confident about the the bird that I think I saw. So, you know, if I describe its um, appearance or you know a call that it was making or um, anything that would help uh, confirm that I've got the right species. But the nice thing about this dot system as well is it sort of flags it for me that um, maybe this is erroneous. <laughs> maybe I didn't actually see a red crossbill. I, I just clicked the wrong species because, um, you know, uh, I'm, my fingers are cold and, you know, I'm out in a, a snowy field. So um, maybe it's a mistake. So this is my last chance to, to fix that. So I can add a description or I can delete the 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 species if um, if it really was just an honest mistake. 
Okay, so, um, and then you're gonna press continue and it will um, ask you if you wanna submit right now. So uh, you can use your data to, to submit it immediately. Or if you'd like to wait until you get home, if you've been birding offline um, and you wanna wait until you have access to Wi-Fi, um, there should be a little X at the top, something like that. And just click the X and it'll save it to your, um, your list of uh, checklists and, and you can do it from home. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, um, so we're gonna flip back to the website and the, be the best way for me to um, explain how to submit a checklist on the website is to, is to do it. So um, I'm going to switch to the website and I'm crossing my fingers that this works. <laughs> All right, um, can everybody see the eBird Canada page? Yep, it's good. Thank you, Raina. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, this is the eBird Canada homepage. Um, because I am signed in, um, it throws up my stats on the first page. Uh, so we're gonna go to the top list of um, tabs and we're gonna click on uh, submit, the very first one. Come on. Here we go. Okay, so uh, the first thing is to choose a location. So I do actually have um, a real list of birds from uh, I think last Thursday that I, I was saving for tonight. So, um, you can choose from a list of existing locations. If I pull the drop, click on the drop down, um, it's a really long list. Or um, I can find it on a map. So I'm going to show you how to find it on a map. So I'm just going to type in Northumberland. All right. So I was in Port Hope. Some of you are going to know this place. I was on Haskell Road. So Haskell Road just happens to um, already be uh, designated as a hotspot. So um, if there wasn't a hotspot here, I'm just gonna click on this. Um, I can just put a uh, drop a pin anywhere on the road um, or wherever I, I was birding. So, um, so this will suit me just fine. I was on Haskell Road. Okay, and I'm gonna press continue. And it wants the date, which was um, last Thursday, the 23rd. And so um, here's the protocol again, uh, traveling, stationary, historical, which um, you can upload um, historical lists. Um, you can go back as far as you'd like, but I'm not gonna really talk about that tonight. Um, or there's that incidental one again. So I was traveling and I started at four o'clock and I, it was a short outing, it was about 45 minutes. And the distance was 1.2 kilometers. And a quick note about this. So um, I walked from one end of Haskell to the other in a straight line, turned around and came back. eBird does not want you to double the distance. So, um, it's a it's a 1.2 kilometer stretch of road. That's my distance, even though to walk back, I actually walked 2.4 kilometers. Um, eBird would just like you to stick to, just report the one, uh, one direction. If you go off on little tangents, um, you know, and, and you do a side road or a looping trail or something, absolutely add that extra distance in, but <clears throat> don't don't double the same road. If you're backtracking over the same trail, uh, don't double it. Okay, I had one of my kids with me, so there were two of us. And you know, comments I can put anything in there, but I think you know I would just I, as I mentioned, I like to put the weather. So I'm just gonna put the it was sunny and a light north wind. Okay, so uh, we're gonna press continue. Here's our list of birds to choose from. So um, uh, we had a couple of mallards. We had, let's see if I can find it. We had a young bald eagle. We had um, 
We had a couple of crows and some chickadees and a nuthatch. Where's the nuthatch? We had a nuthatch and starlings. Um, always lots of starlings on that road. And lastly, we had some song sparrows. Okay, so not a very big list. Um, oh, I forgot. I did forget one. Where is it? There, we had a nice male bluebird. All right, so I've got my list. And it's going to ask me, um, just like the mobile app, uh, are you submitting a complete checklist? And yes, I am. So I click yes and submit. So there we go. Um, it's been uploaded. I can see my list. Um, but uh, this is when um, I have the option of adding media. So that would be uh, photos or sound. Um, currently, eBird does not uh, let you upload videos. Uh, okay, so um, I do have a photo. I, I think I have a terrible photo of the young eagle. So I can click add media and it's gonna bring up the, the complete list and I find the species that I want, in this case, the eagle, and I click add media. And then it's gonna take me to my desktop. I selected my photo and it usually pops up fairly quickly. So, um, and that is the wrong picture. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> this is an eagle, but it's the wrong eagle. All right, I will fix this later, but for now it's fine. Um, so we're just gonna click done. And there's our list. So um, the next thing uh, we can look at <clears throat> now that we've done a list, is if I go back up to the top here and I click on my eBird. All right, so this is just some of my own stats, but um, the important things are down the left-hand side here. <clears throat> so this is where I can manage my checklists. Um, I can do a number of things, um, set up alerts. I can uh, edit my profile. Um, I can look at my preferences. Actually, I'll show you this quickly. Um, this is where you find that um, privacy information that I mentioned earlier. So um, it's under the My eBird tab. And this is where I can, if I would like to hide my name, I can switch to anonymous eBirder uh, and I can hide, uh, I can prevent my data from um, being included in alerts. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to my eBird and let's take a quick look at my checklist. So these are all recent checklists. And here's the one we just submitted from Haskell Road. So um, let's open that up because maybe I would like to revise something. I forgot a bird. So we can go to edit species and we're right back sort of where we started with our big list of birds. And I forgot a blue jay. So I can add that in and just resave it. And there, my list has been revised and there's the blue jay that I forgot about. Okay, so, um, uh, what, so I will take you back to the My eBird page. And I'd just like to quickly show you the alerts. So, um, this can be um, handy if um, you're really interested in hearing about um, rare birds that uh, have been reported in a given area. So um, I have subscribed to a few up here. Um, uh, what have I got? I've got rare birds um, for Northumberland and some uh, nearby counties. Uh, you can also subscribe to um, a list of birds that you just haven't seen yet this year that they refer to that as your, your needs list. So when you subscribe to these things, um, and here we could uh, we could add one. Um, so let's say I, I would like to add Toronto to my list. So I just click on Toronto and say subscribe. And now it's been, there it is, it's, it's been added to my list. Um, 
So that means that I will get daily emails um, telling me if a rare bird has been reported in Toronto. And I think you can change it to hourly, like some of these say hourly. Um, so you don't want to get too carried away. Otherwise, you're going to flood your um, email inbox <laughs> with an awful lot of eBird reports. Um, but it can be kind of fun to, to see what's going on around you. Okay. And um, yes, I think that was it for uh, the um, this section, the My eBird. So before we leave the live website, um, again, if you go back up to the tabs at the top and click on explore uh, brings you to um, this page where there is so much that you can look at. Um, and you don't really have time tonight to, to dive into all of this. Um, I would encourage you just to have a little fun exploring it yourself. You can uh, go into species maps and um, pull up uh, information on you know birds that have been seen anywhere around the world. Um, I use it quite a bit um, just to see, you know, if I just want to see what's what's been going on at Presqu'il, you know, what what kind of birds have been <clears throat> seen there uh, recently. Or maybe you're really hoping to find a, a bird you haven't um, seen for a while or, or that you've never seen. And, and it's a way to find out, um, get some ideas for places that you could go uh, to look for particular species. So Lots of great information on this on this page, but um, yeah, definitely just uh, come here uh, when you've got some some time to poke around. It's it's well worthwhile. Okay, um, I'm going to take us back to the slide deck and let's see. I need to go to here. We go. All right. Um, so we're gonna flip briefly back to the mobile version. Um, so there are fewer options for exploring data using the mobile app, but you can still see um, nearby hotspots. So here's a little example here. Um, when you click on explore, it will show you a map and you can zoom in and out um, and pick any of these uh, locations. Um, so in this case, I've, I'm showing you Haskell Road uh, and it'll pop up a, a, a list of all the species that have been reported there. So um, I know that you can only see a few here, but if you scroll down, um, this is showing you the, the species that have been seen in the last couple of weeks. But you can also um, uh, click on this part and, and see all the species that uh, have ever been reported at that location. Um, and the little graph is, is showing you <clears throat> um, what months of the year these birds are being seen. Okay, so um, there's so much more on the eBird site. Um, uh, lots of great uh, scientific data. If, if you really want to do a deep dive, um, you can look at status and trends, uh, data and tools, all kinds of research projects and publications. Um, if you need more help, um, you have a million questions uh, that we don't get to today. Uh, the Cornell website for eBird um, has an excellent help center um, with all kinds of answers uh, to be found right there. Um, and I also find YouTube to be a great resource. Uh, there are lots of instructional videos that have been created by eBird users. And sometimes that's a really nice way to, to learn how to use some of these um, features is, is to watch somebody else demonstrating it for you. Um, I think Marina mentioned this. Uh, there is a free course um, from Cornell called eBird Essentials. Um, it has nine instructional videos and uh, there's a link that will um, take you there, uh, I think right on the bottom of the, uh, the Explore tab on, on the website. Um, I think Marina even mentioned taking some of these. So um, probably well worth your while. Um, we always like free things. All right, uh, lastly, just for fun, um, there's a, a really fun little quiz that you can access um, on, uh, I think it's on the Explore tab as well. Uh, so it's a little birding quiz. You can either um, do it with photographs or with sound. 
And by playing um, or participating in the quiz, you're actually helping the Merlin app to learn. So um, not only are you uh, selecting um, an answer to uh, a question about a, a species or trying to, you know, identifying a, a photo or a sound, um, you actually rate the photo and sound as, as far as the quality. And that helps um, Merlin and, and Cornell categorize, you know, the millions of pieces of media so that they they can zero in on the the photographs and the and the sound recordings that are the best quality that that help the Merlin app learn. Um, so yeah, you can find that link right on the website. Um, I've I've uh, used it a few times myself. Um, it's kind of fun, and um, if you're feeling like your skills are a, a little rusty because um, you haven't seen Warblers for eight months, uh, it's it's a fun thing to to try. Okay, and I think that kind of wraps up the eBird presentation. Um, so I will uh, ask if there are any questions. So again, you can ask questions by unmuting yourself or you can type into the chat. Uh, Chris, I have a question about the checklist. Yes. Uh, I noticed that there on the checklist, there are specific birds that are listed but there are other categories that have SP behind them. What are they? Oh, SP um, just for species. So um, you, you know you saw a gull, but you're not sure which one. You can just put gull species or um, you, you know you saw a flycatcher, but you're you know having difficulty uh, determining which, which one. So you can just put species, the SP for, for species. It's uh, it's just a general category. So um, it's still useful data and, and you know, it reminds me that you, you, you saw that bird, but we can't always, we can't identify them all. We do that a lot with, okay. you know, those really distant ducks or, or those really distant raptors, you know, raptor spa. Okay. Um, if you, if you see a bird, and you know what species it is, but it's not on the eBird list when you do your checklist. How do you how do you document the bird that you've seen on eBay? Or sorry, eBird. Yeah. Um, you should be able to just uh, type the name in because yeah, there are sometimes a few um, a few species uh, that. I don't really I don't really remember why they don't always show up or it's just because they're they're fairly rare for the area but usually if you type um, type the species name in uh, can you show me where that I type that in um I can try hang on so I'm still sharing so I'm gonna go back um, to eBird. What would be an easy way to show you here? Um, oh, okay. Submit. Uh, I'm gonna, okay, so I'm gonna go back to a, a checklist. This would be the easiest thing. And I, I don't wanna start a new checklist. Let, let's go back to the that checklist we just submitted. All right, so um, I need to click on edit species to, to return us to the species list. So the first thing you should try is over here on the right-hand side, it says uh, right. show rarities. Okay, so I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna to try to click on it. There we go. Okay, um, the list just got a lot longer. Okay, and okay. It, it's showing you, it, it tells you right away um, the, the species that are rare. Um, but if you, if you do this and you still can't find your bird, um, you can type it in this window right here. And All I'll right, great. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I have a question. Um, I just want to congratulate all the presenters tonight. I just wondered if the presenters use these apps interchangeably or do you have favorites and, and why you would have a favorite? <laughs> um well I I like uh doing most of my lists um at home 
in the comfort of my office on the eBird website. Um, I do sometimes use uh, make lists with the eBird uh, mobile app um, when I'm in the field, but I don't very often actually submit from the field. I, I don't know why, I just, I, I have a tendency to wait until I get home and, and I'll, I'll upload my, my list at home. Uh, I think Maureen is the opposite, aren't you? You you prefer. I am the opposite. Yep. I yeah. usually submit my lists from my phone right after I've completed my birding walk or whatever it is. And I almost rarely go on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Jerry? No, I haven't used the eBird very much, but. Uh... Yeah, I am um, starting to use it now. But yeah, I use I use both. Um, I primarily both use Merlin and I Naturalist, depending on what I'm trying to identify. Uh, um, it's my is my my one two go to, but I'm starting to use eBird a little bit as well. Uh, I, I use I Naturalist a lot, um, or I'm I'm trying to remember to use it more. Um, I don't really use it for birds though because. All my birds go into eBird, and then I have a tendency to forget to put them in iNaturalist as well. Now, I, now I know how to share them over, so I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a very that's <laughs> no, something. No I, more excuses. More, yep. Yeah, and that's really good for things like when we do um, birding outings and and uh, spring bird counts and things like that, where people can, can you know are using their their favorite but can take the time to also say, load it up to iNaturalist or one of the other ones. It really helps uh, um, share the information um, through those databases. Okay. Any other- I too, oh, sorry, go I ahead, too like to use eBird uh, at home to compile my uh, observation lists. And I noticed that when I add entries into eBird that um, it automatically shows up on Merlin in my uh, my life list, uh, which I thought is very handy. Yeah, they're very intertwined. They are made by both are made by Cornell, and there's a lot going on in the background together. So. Are there nice any presentation? Oh, thank you. So I think uh, if I'll just ask if there's any more questions for Chris regarding eBird. And if there aren't, uh, Jerry, did you want to clarify that one point for Brian? Um, I looked into it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get have to follow up on it. I don't know the answer. I, I thought it might have been because you have three selections, and you know, there's a a tab that's for joined projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I noticed that when I looked under the tab for joined projects, you know, West Laville is there, along with some other ones, but they don't appear under my nearby projects. Right. Once so I thought maybe there's. Yeah, but Brian says he hasn't joined the Wesleyville one, so oh. I'm not sure why that's not showing up on, on his okay. list, but I'll look into it. All right, so I see no more questions in the chat, so thank you, Chris, and I'll just uh, wrap up by sharing um, this slide. So um, we mentioned there's all kinds of apps, tons and tons of apps. Whoops, sorry, I need to get through this. Uh, there's all kinds of apps. So a couple more I'm going to mention, I'm not even going to get into, but I'm going to throw these out to you in case you're interested. If you are into, into astronomy, try Skyview Light. It's a free app. Point it at the sky. It'll tell you the constellations that you're looking at. Another app, if you are interested in plants, picture this as a plant identifier. Again, get it from the app store. Um, it op operates similar to Google Lens, if you're familiar how Google Lens works, but this is for plants and it can give you all kinds of information about the plant. So this is really useful if you're a terrible gardener like me and you don't know what's out in your garden, this is good for it, or when you're out on walks and you want to identify the wildflowers. So final thoughts, um, I will be posting a um, the uh, the recording of this presentation on our outings page in on our WBFN website. It'll happen in a day or two. Encourage you to explore the apps and the sites that we've mentioned, play around for, with them for a bit, check out the help sections if we 
as you germinate on this, whether if there's new questions that come up, the help sections might be able to answer those questions or even watch some of the videos if you wanna learn more and get into more detail. And even after all of that help and all of that, those FAQs and so on, if you still have additional questions, email me at willowbeachfn at gmail.com and I'll see if I can help you or I will throw your question out to Jerry or Chris for additional help if we can, if we're able to help you. So thank you to Chris. Thank you to Jerry. It was a great effort on your part to put the great slides together. So appreciate it very much. Thank you everybody for attending and we're going to close it here and say, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.